Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. We are talking about remote working, ways to set up your uh, remote desk, um, just some things to keep in mind, uh, little things like that that's just going to make remote working a little bit easier. Now, whenever I do this presentation, uh, I always realize that there are people not only who are being managed while they're working remotely, there are also people who are managing teams and uh, they're working remotely and their teams are working remotely. So what I've done this time, changing it up just a little bit, I'm gonna be giving out a lot of tips and advice and such um, from both perspectives. Okay, so, so a lot of the information that I have is going to be on how to manage people, but if you're one of those people that you're being managed, just kind of flip it around um, because you can ask for, you know, you can, it can help set up your expectations of what your manager should be providing to you and making sure, you know, to keep you engaged and, and uh, um, yeah, member of the team, member of, a productive member of the team. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, um, let's see, because this is, uh, being recorded instead of an in-person, sometimes I'll do like a little poll with hand raisings and such, but I'm just going to give you three interesting facts. Okay, so usually I'd say true or false, but um, I'm just going to kind of read these to you. I've got some facts that kind of throw people a little bit. So um, just some kind of, just some things to keep in mind. Okay, first of all, uh, one thing that's surprising, that surprises people about remote working is that it is legal. It's legal. Uh, to pay remote workers differently than in person, as long as the reason for the difference in pay. So you can pay remote workers less than you pay your in-person employees, as long as the main reason for that pay gap is remote working, um, but genuine remote working. What could happen is... Uh, and this this is where a company can kind of fall into a little trap here. Uh, not trap, that's not the right word. They can fall into a hole, a pit, pit hole. Um, if all of their remote workers are single mothers and everybody else, you know, is, is but they've decided to give single mothers uh, the opportunity to work from home. But then they say, but we're going to pay our remote workers less. There's too much similarity between those employees where people could say, well, you're actually paying people less. They're being penalized because they're moms, um, because they don't have any other support or you know, whatever it is. You have to look and make sure that the group of people are not within a protected classification that's protected from discrimination. If they are, you could be charged with discrimination. However, if you are just, you know, part of your normal work, you've been offered remote work and you take it, and later on you find out that you're making less than your colleagues who are in the office, that actually is, uh, that's perfectly legal. legal. Okay, so there's num number one surprise. Number two, it is completely legal. Uh, let's say that you were hired on the basis that, uh, that this job was going to be remote. Two weeks later, three weeks later, two months later, you know, whatever, um, it is perfectly legal for the job to say, well, you know what, we've decided to end remote working. All of our employees are coming back to the office. You're reporting back to the office in a month. Um, and someone would say, wait a minute, that's that can't be legal. I was hired on the basis that this is a remote job. Nope, um, that is completely legal. The only exception to that is if you actually had an employment contract that stipulates that you would be able to remote work uh, to work remotely. Most of the positions in the United States are not, um, you know, do not have an employment contract with them. So, um, and then the third surprise: it is perfectly legal to make employees pay for their transportation uh, to travel to come to important meetings. So, let's say that you are hired by a company in uh, New Mexico and you're here in Illinois 
and they say, well, four times a year, our company uh, brings in all the employees for this conference or, you know, quarterly meetings, you know, whatever it is, um, you would be responsible to handle your own travel. Now, that's not to say that your company may not offer that or that's all actually also, you know, you could po potentially negotiate that in, uh, in your in part of your salary negotiations, but there's nothing that requires that the company will, uh, that they legally have to pay for that. The exception to that, there's always an exception. The exception is uh, California based company. So California, they're a little bit more friendly towards employees and they say employers, you can't, you either cannot force your employees to come in or you have to foot the bill, uh, foot the bill for their travel. So there you go. So there's three surprises um, about remote working. And by the way, guess what? Most of these th things were not issues, um, you know, or if they were issues, they were such quiet issues because so little of the population was remote working prior to the pandemic. So these are all big issues now that people are talking about and facing and arguing in courts um, pretty much because of the pandemic. So, um, but you know what, that's, these things have to get knocked around and, and figured out and everything. So um, I'm sure that there will be more surprises down the road as we continue um, to rely on remote work. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, in the United States, prior to the pandemic, only 6% of, uh, of employed people were working from home, were working remotely. Um, and at least 75% of the working population had never work from home, these jobs, you know, the professional office jobs. When I'm talking about working from home, by the way, I am talking about the jobs that typically could be also um, done from home. So I'm not talking about retail cashiers, um, healthcare workers, things like that. So, but uh, yeah, prior, prior to the pandemic, 75% um, of jobs had never, ever even been considered for remote working that are now remote working. Um, so in May of 2020, that's about when everything kind of, you know, really big happened, um, over one third of the employed workforce worked from home due to the pandemic. So a third, 33% of the population just like overnight, whoop, we're going home. Um, that does not count people who were just laid off or businesses closed and then reopened later. Seamless business continuity, 33% uh, just started working from, from home and all of a sudden companies said, hey, guess what? We can, you know, we can have our employees work from home when a week prior they never ever, they would have said, absolutely not, our business cannot be conducted from home. And what do you know, now it can be. Uh, let's see, offices, uh, of course, you know, offices, professional, um, type businesses, those were the ones that primarily created these work from home situations for their employees. Uh, let's see, and most employees now up to ooh, 75, 85% of employees actually now expect to work from home either permanently or on a hybrid. Um, so people are really enjoying, and Matt, Matt and I were just talking before this about presentations, you know, how many of your presentations are done remotely versus in person. And, um, you know, so it's it's kind of interesting the way it kind of seeps into a lot of different areas. Um, so um, I just, sorry, I had a thought <laughs> and didn't want to follow it. Um, but now there are a lot of technology, um, a lot of collaborative tools out there. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little a little bit about those. Uh, of course, those tools are continuously evolving, um, continuously going to change the way we think about remote work and, you know, what type of remote work is even possible now. Uh, let's see. So I've got another facts and figure. I love data. I love data. So among um, Gen Y millennials and Gen Z and no millennial bashing, millennials are like 45 now. So, um, but Gen Y, Gen Z workers in 2019, 
um, in 2019, so prior to the pandemic, 69% of Gen Y and Gen Z um, employees cited a willingness to forego promotions, uh, raises, and some benefits just to get remote or flexible working alternatives. Uh, now, likewise, in 2019, baby boomers and Gen X, uh, I think the number was in the 20s, that tw you know, 20, 25% of them said that they were willing to forego benefits or promotions or anything like that to accommodate work from home. Just wasn't, you know, wasn't something on the radar whatsoever. Um, so interestingly enough, concurrent, you know, concurrent to the shift. I actually, I'm going to take that back because side, side, I'm going to talk about um, the gig economy, side hustles and such. Um, so side hustles started to be really, really popular, I would say maybe about in the past 10 years or so, growing growing hugely every single year. But one thing that came around because of side hustles um, is co-working spaces. If you're not familiar with co-working spaces, they're pretty cool. Um, and there are actually plenty of them in, in the Chicagoland area. Um, but they're places where people can go if they're working from home, uh, doing remote type work, they can go into a co-working space, rent space. And it is very much almost like an office but the thing is, your coworkers, the people who are working around you, are actually working on their own side hustles or creating businesses or whatever it is. But they'll have complete office setups. Um, they could have like you know snacks and you know things like that. And they're they're usually pretty modern, pretty cool places to be. So interestingly enough, then the pandemic hits and co-working spaces just boomed, absolutely boomed. So those co-working spaces were already there. So now a lot of these people who are working from home are now in co-working spaces and thriving and realizing, you know, this remote work, it, does, it doesn't have to be as isolating as people think it is um, because they can actually get out and do a little bit of socializing and feel like they're in kind of a busy office environment. So that's been really, really helpful to a lot of people. Um, you know, there's another thought, and it's a phrase that I just love so much, um, and I can't even take credit for it, but uh, I belonged to a networking group. It was kind of a business, business owner's mastermind group, and we would all call ourselves um, location agnostic. It's not a great phrase. Um, and what location agnostic meant is that you could work from anywhere. You know, I could work from, and often I did actually, um, I have conducted business from, um, Wisconsin Dells. I've conducted business in Mexico. Um, I've conducted business in Florida. So, you know, little in Minneapolis, uh, you know, little trips and stuff, but I am, you know, my business is considered location agnostic. Um, and that's that's really a lot of what, you know, remote, remote working is all about, finding ways to still be productive and effective and running a business and, um, you know, making a living basically from wherever, you know, wherever life takes you. And, um, you know, like I said, prior, prior to, to March, you know, March, May of 2020, this idea was completely foreign to people. And now, it's just become an entire industry, a very, you know, kind of a cool, exciting industry. Um, so now, all right, so and I'm going to flip to a slide because even though really no company has to offer remote working, um, the statistics show us that really they should. So what I'm going to do is show you a slide here. There we go. And I'm going to hide some of these and I'm going to hide my little zoom controls. There we go. Okay. So uh, if you can take, oops, let me do presentation mode. Sorry about that. Ta-da. Okay. So um, if you can see this, uh, this little chart here, you can see, and I'm not, this is something that's been floating around. And then I tried to backtrack the actual source of this and couldn't find it. 
I'm, I, I'm not able to cite my source on this. I'm so sorry. And it's not even like in the little, you know, in the little margin or anything, but, but I did not make this up. I pulled it from, from a remote working site. There's so many of them out there. Um, so 55% today, uh, in the past year or so, 55% of remote workers state that they would look elsewhere if their remote working opportunity was taken away. Um, so really, you know, employees are hanging on to this fiercely because it is such a um, such a lifestyle change. As, and as a matter of fact, uh, let's see, remote workers. OK, so remote worker, if you look over in the right right here, remote workers feel a greater sense of belonging and communicate more frequently uh, with their teams online. Uh, the key is establishing um, object objectives and, uh, you know, objectives around remote working to ensure that everyone feels more comfortable with those who work from home. And remote workers state that they feel more engaged with their jobs and their coworkers more so than employees who are not offered, not just people who decide to come into the office, but for people who are not offered the chance of remote working, their engagement is starting to check out. And that's part of what everybody, you know, that's part of the big conversation around quiet quitting. Um, you know, of course, and there's, you know, the opposite of that is quiet firing and quiet promoting. So, you know, all these little phrases, these things, these ideas were around for a long, long time. They just now have catchy, you know, social media friendly terms on them. But employee engagement, is, it really is. And it, it's not, um, you know, it, that is not... How do I want to say it's not um, specific to any particular generation or point in time. Um, employee engagement has been around since, you know, employees were like inventing wheels. So, <laughs> um, but this is really something, you know, this, this is really, really something that is changing the employment landscape really like nothing has in a long, long time. So, like I said, you know, 55% of remote employees, if that was suddenly taken away from them, they would look for other work. So employers, you know, they have to pay attention to this, um, especially at a time when employee um, employers are dealing with, you know, we're coming out of the great, I don't know if we are or not, but hopefully coming out of the great recession and now all these conversations about quiet quitting and stuff, employers are really scrambling to create reasons um you know benefits and and perks and things like that to make their employees stay and too often it's they're not really going they think well we'll you know we'll change this per we'll give this person a promotion in uh in their title or you know we'll bring in bagels or something it's like no people aren't looking for bagels and you know the the surface stuff they're looking for true um, appreciation and balance, you know, bringing, being able to enjoy the hours that they work, you know, that's, that's really, really what, what they're looking for. All right. So let me get out of this for just a minute here. Okay. So, um, so what can employers do? You know, what can employers do? And if you are an employee, what should you be looking out for? What, you know, what can employers do for you uh, that will make you feel more engaged? And number one, absolute number one is provide resources. Provide resources to your remote team. So employees find out in the interview, find out in informational interviews, um, you know, as soon as possible, find out what those companies are doing, what resources they are providing. Um, you know, to not only establish good communication, but also, you know, are they going to give you the tools that you need, you know, laptop, headset, you know, things like that. So, but a lot of it really comes down to the communication. Um, a lot of, and so if you are, if you're at a company, so not changing into, not coming into a new company, but if some, you know, if you were employed at a company and now they are deciding, you know what, we're, we're going to go to remote. So this is not a new thing for you. 
one of the things that employers can and managers can do is make sure to communicate now that remote working is is an option and remote working is something that they're going to be working with how is the actual work going to change how is productivity going to be measured um might some of the objectives um and you know the production objectives change um you know a lot of times with remote work that actually is is the case maybe more um because now you don't have these other meetings to attend or could it be less because now you're going to be on more remote meetings or you're having to check in more over um slack or you know whatever it is so if you're managing or if you are being managed, make sure that there's a really, really strong communication and plan, not only one on one with your manager, but also if you're a member of a team, make sure that that team is communicating and make sure that, you know, also to make sure that the entire team is pulling their weight and staying on track. Um, so it's important to discuss those and if you are going to be meeting with your manager one-on-one -on -one, make sure to discuss uh, not only what work is expected of you but also make sure to set some goals what are your professional goals now that uh, now that the job has shifted around a lot because the the managers may say well now that we're all remote working uh, we may be looking at a different timeline as far as promotions or we, we may be putting some of these projects on hold and you might have been earmarked to be on one of those project teams. So again, really good communication. Um, and of course, all of those goals, this gets into a completely different, uh, different conversation, but make sure that those goals are clearly stated, are clearly understood, um, that they are deadline specific, that they are um, measurable, that they are reachable. Um, you know, there's that there's smart goals that everyone can agree on. Um, you know, and then my next bit of advice for employers is uh, trust your remote employees. You know, trust your remote employees, especially, my goodness, now people are into their, you know, second, third, fourth remote job since the pandemic kind of lightened up, right? So uh, you may be hiring people for the first time ever having remote employees in your company, but you may be bringing on people who now are quite comfortable uh, and productive and effective with remote working. So just because this, you know, this new remote working is here doesn't mean that it automatically has to establish a level of distrust. You know, what is this person doing? Are, are they, you know, are they going to be working continuously or might they also be doing a load of laundry? My goodness, at this point, I mean, if the work is getting done, employers, you know, employees need some autonomy, particularly if they are producing well and if they are effective and if they're um, if they're able to do the job that you've hired them to do. Who cares if there's some laundry going on? Um, this is this is employee happiness. This is how you keep effective. You know, this is how you retain those employees employees that you want to stay on your team. Um, and then reward, um, incentivize, and recognize when your team is doing well. Likewise, if you're an employee being managed, ask about what type of recognition, um, you know, and is actually available for the teams. You know, what have you done? What, if, what have you done in place when your remote teams are doing exceptionally well? What does that look like? Um, Prior to the pandemic, when there, you know, when there was very, very little remote working, if a team did great, it usually meant, you know, lunch in a conference room or, you know, something like that. Well, with remote workers, you can't do that. But there are plenty, plenty of ways, and this has become its own in industry as well, um, incentivizing remote teams, things that, uh, you know, things that employers can purchase and have sent out, you know, delivered, um, activities in, in your your uh, employees' local areas or dinners, things like that. So, trust me, if you if you are in an interview and you're asking an employer about you know how they incentivize or recognize 
when a team has done a great job and they say, well, I don't know. I mean, does anything like that exist? Oh, that would be a red flag because trust me, every single manager is bombarded, um, you know, with all of these new products and ideas and things that they can buy. So if they don't know that big red flag and then managers this is for the managers. But again, if you're an employee, kind of pay attention to this, get your employee feedback follow up with your, your, with your employees a lot, check in with them. Even if, you know, even if for whatever reason you aren't able to establish, you know, weekly check-ins or you know, bi-weekly check-ins, whatever it is, then it doesn't have to be formal. It can be unstructured, but just, you know, with consistency, check in with your employer, employees and find out how they're doing. Do they need any resources? Uh, are there any, kind of tools or anything that they would like to have that would make them that much more effective Are they running into any obstacles, anything like that. And just really be, um, you know, have an open door policy remotely um, for all of these ideas. Because again, remember, you know, your employees, they do not live in a vacuum. They, they talk to other people. They're online, you know, figuring out they're on chat, you know, in different chat rooms and, are people in chat room, not chat rooms, but like in different, I don't know, idea sites where, where ideas are shared. Um, you know, so, so they're finding out what other employers are doing and saying, oh, that sounds really great. Well, rather than have them say, yeah, I want to leave because I want that too. Give them in, a, you know, an opportunity to bring that idea to you and say, is there anything that we could do to make this work? So listen to your employees and trust that they will have good information from you. So what are the benefits of, uh, of working from home? Ooh, lots of benefits, right? So, and the first one for the business, so a couple of them for the business, it saves money. You know, it saves money. You could downsize from the type of office that you're now having to pay rent on. And of course, you know, utilities, uh, resource savings, you know, so capital, um, capital costs, all, you know, property costs, all sorts of business savings for them. Um, and again, it does, as we've seen by the numbers, it lessens employee attrition and hiring employees and every, every owner, every business knows this hiring employees is expensive. The whole, whole process from deciding we need this employee to now making sure that the person that's hired is in place, it's expensive. Um, so, create those opportunities where employee attrition is going to go down. Um, it actually does boost. It's, it's been shown by the numbers. It helps to boost uh, employee collaboration. Now, I know that sounds a little counterintuitive uh, because people are saying, well, without, but it's the employers that are mostly saying this, not necessarily the employees. Um, you know, employers say, well, there's no collaboration because they're not in person. But you know what? There are so many great tools. There's Slack, um, Teams, Google, uh, all of Google, Microsoft, all of them have their, you know, have their tech tools where uh, Zoom, um, you know, where collaboration is absolutely possible and thriving right now. Uh, a lot of my clients who have been working remotely actually say that they're more comfortable collaborating from, you know, from a remote workspace because it's more in their style of communication um, rather than sitting in meetings, you know, in-person meetings, uh, you know, the whole joke is a two-hour meeting could be summed up in one email, you know, and quite often that's true. So a lot of these tools are meant for shorter, quicker collaboration, and that's been proving to be just as effective. So again, if you're an employee looking for that type of, uh, you know, wondering what the, what's out there, ask in the interview. So how, you know, how are your remote teams collaborating with each other? How, you know, how often, what tools did they use to talk to each other during the day? How often is that? And just get a sense and, and really look for a confident and positive answer. Like, oh, we've already got that in place. We've got Slack channels. We've got teams and such and such. Um, and also, if you're hiring remotely, uh, your talent pool has just expanded greatly. Um, 
And from an employee side, I can't tell you how many of my candidates now working in remote, uh, rural, you know, more rural areas are able to look for jobs that they never could have pursued before. So it's actually meaning really great career advancement for a lot of people who didn't necessarily have that on their radar before. Um, people are able to look at companies who do a little bit more promoting, um, whereas previously maybe they were kind of closed off to those companies because of geography. So just the fact that the talent pool is so much more expansive now uh, has been really a, a huge help both on the employer and the employer side, employer and employee side. Um, and then what are some of the cons of working from home? Um, it's not suitable for all jobs, as you can imagine. Uh, and then, of course, the big one, management mistrust. Um, you know, that's something I think that that's really something that's going to just have to work. Uh, uh, so prior to <laughs> prior to the, the pandemic, you know, and now we've got management mistrust of their remote employees. Well, prior to that, I would have um, I would have my clients say. I really want to be on LinkedIn, but my manager will know if I update my profile and wonder if I'm going to quit. Management mistrust, <laughs> you know, so, or people taking, you know, asking for time off of work or, oh, I had a client who uh, came in one day and she was dressed nicer than usual, but I don't remember why. And there was no reason for it. Um, but her manager pulled her aside and said, and basically accused her of interviewing for a job because she was dressed nicer than she was. Now, this happened prior. So she wasn't even interviewing at this time. But again, management mistrust. So here's the thing. Management mistrust is going to exist for one reason or another. I think that, you know, they just have to get used to it. So if you are managing your employees, again, so much wasted energy in that. Treat your people well. Retention goes up. Attrition goes down. So um, another kind of uh, con, I guess, can, you know, yeah, con about remote working is that um, if certain departments or certain groups are able to work from home and others aren't because of the business structure, because of the type of work that they do, there could be some jealousy within the ranks and that sort of thing causing some problems. Um, for the employee side, it's possible, and you have to look into this if you are looking at remote working, and I'm not an accountant, I'm not a financial planner, so I'm not giving you specific financial or tax advice, but it is quite possible to be double taxed uh, on your income, depending on where you live, depending on where the employer lives. Just look into that, and that's all I can say about that, because again, I'm not a professional. Uh, you know, but that's that's kind of a big issue. So make sure to look into that. Now, for those of you who are looking at working from home for the first time, the most important thing you can do once you've decided this is what I'm going to do is designate a workspace. OK, designate a workspace that is yours, uh, that is private and that has all the tools you need. Now, if this is going to be something where an employer is supporting this, hopefully they will designate, you know, they could mail you out a laptop. Um, if you use your own laptop, then you want to make sure that the employer needs to make sure that you have the minimum requirements, like if they need at least, you know, Microsoft 10, Windows 10, you know, whatever it is, or whatever kind of software programs. Uh, and make sure that you have, you know, strong Wi-Fi, anything like that. A lot of that really is the employer's um, if you're an employee, now freelance, independent contractor, that's completely different. But if you're an employee, it really is on the part of the employer to make sure that um, the hardware, the software, um, the bandwidth, the you know Wi-Fi and all of that, whatever they can do to make sure that their needs are being met, that really is on the part of the employer. Um, then there is uh, you know, other software concerns, such as is the, um, excuse me, um, 
are they going to install? And this is something that uh, you should know. And if they're sending you a company branded laptop, there could be software on, installed on there that basically tracks, you know, tracks their employers, uh, their employees. It could be time tra tracking, it could be keyboard, it could even be like character tracking. Uh, they, there are companies who require that their employees are on Zoom all day um, so they can just check in and make sure that this person's working. So a lot, a lot of those. There have been some issues recently, very, very recently, actually, where... Um, <clears throat> so going back to the tracking, um, some of the software could be connected to the mouse where an employer can actually tell how often in an hour or whatever your mouse moves. Well, employees can go onto Amazon and purchase a little device. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but purchase a little device that will just keep your mouse moving. Prior to the pandemic, um, for people who worked remotely, this actually was a device that was not uncommon. Um, you know, I don't, I don't even know what jobs these are, but you see people who have like two, three, four monitors in front of them. Well, a little mouse mover will actually keep their, uh, their screens alive. Okay. And so the screen wouldn't die and then they'd have to go and figure out which one and, you know, wake it up again and blah, blah, blah. So you get one of these little mouse movers. There are three big stories out right now where employees got fired, remote workers got fired because they use these mouse movers and the employer was able to determine that by their software and said, well, you're obviously messing with the system. You're not giving us the work that you're supposed to give us um, and fired them. So now that's a big, you know, Big conflict between employees and employers um, in, in remote working. So just find out. And employers, see, you know, this, this is an interesting area. I'm, I'm not sure if by law, and I'll bet this is really gray too. I don't know if, if by law an employer needs to tell you exactly what tracking um, software they have. But I also know there are ways that you can go into any laptop and find out exactly what software is on there. So that's probably something that I would advise if you are using a company branded laptop. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to show some other slides right now because I want to talk more about workstations here. So let's see. I had my little zoom controls. Okay. Okay, so, yep. So, and this is such a <laughs> such a boring little graphic here, but you want to at least make sure that you have an idea. If you're going to be working remotely, you want to have the essentials here, right? So, what might those essentials be? Obviously, a desk and a chair, uh, whatever computer you're using. Surge protector, very, very important, especially, you know, if you're employers, a lot of employers will actually require their employees to have surge protectors, um, you know, printer, if you've got any um, uh, sensitive information, sensitive papers, they may, you know, or important papers, they may require that you have a fire safe box. Um, so that they're protected, that sort of thing. So just make sure to figure out what those basics are. Um, but there are, well, I'll show you here. Let me show you what I've got here. So I'm going to show you a picture of my actual workspace that I have from home. This is my work. This is actually, you know, obviously a picture, but I am sitting at this workspace right now. Um, and as you can see, my office works workspace is uh, 36 inches wide by, or long, I always get confused, wide, yeah, wide by 16 inches deep. That's what this shelf is. Uh, this And these are one of these shelving units that you can buy, you know, it's just the, 
mesh, the vinyl coated wire shelves or whatever. I think it probably cost what 80 bucks or whatever at Walmart. Um, and it just fits really nice into this kind of little nook. And this is this room. This is actually quite a large room. Previously, on the opposite side of this, and I'm not going to show you that because it's not exactly clean right now, but um, the other side of this is a very long wall. When I first started Resume Day back in 2001, um, so this room has always been my office. And what I did was I got a, a long, I had a very long desk. It was actually kind of a board that I got at Menards for very inexpensive, and I propped it up with file cabinets. I had tons of, you know, a bunch of different file cabinets because I had tons of paper. Every resume I wrote, I printed out every contract and everything, tons and tons of paper. Um, and I had, you know, in this long desk, it was just taken up with things that I had convinced myself that I needed. During the pandemic, I decided, you know what? <sighs> I just, I, I just need a different work environment. I just, you know, I need to shake things up a little bit. Cleared out the entire room and said, and I said, I'm going to downsize. You know, I don't think that I need as much room as I'm taking up. And that's when I noticed this little nook area that, by the way, has always been a design disaster. I never knew what to do with it. I said, I wonder if I could actually use this as my work area and then just have the rest of the room to have, you know, my plants, and as you can see, plants, well, you're looking at my slide right now, but, you know, I have all the different things that I want in this room rather than this big, long space dedicated to my work desk. So I decided, you know what, it's a pandemic. I can, now's a good time to try something out, and if it doesn't work, it's not going to mean a big, you know, shutdown for my business. Uh, things were, you know, a little slow anyway. So I decided to try it out, and all I can tell you is I wish that I had done this 20 years ago. <laughs> this has been my favorite workspace ever, ever. Um, less is more, for sure. So, you know, you see, I've just, everything I need, and here's the thing. Guess what? Those file cabinets, I have one. I have one, and most of it has, like, I think one of the trays, one of the drawers, and it has papers that I, if something happened to them, nothing would change. Um, and the other drawer, I think, has craft supplies. <laughs> so, like scissors and glue and beads and I don't, I, clay, I don't know, all sorts of stuff like that. Because I just don't need as much paper as I thought I did. All of my business, um, you know, like tape, stapler and everything like that, that's in one of the boxes that's above my workspace. And that picture frame with like the kind of like rust colored cover uh, colors there, that's actually, I made that, um, bought that picture frame at a thrift shop for I think $3 and then just did some like spray paint with metallics and stuff. And that's actually my dry erase board. The glass, I just write on, you know, write any client notes and anything on there. Um, and then it just dry, it dries up. It's the perfect whiteboard. So there you go. And I've got my little, you can see up to, you know, above my shoulder to the left here. I've got a little uh, magnetic board where I can keep different notes and things. And everything I need is right here in this very, very little bit of space. Uh, this is the best part of my, <laughs> of my workstation. This is my coworker, Gemma. Um, and an interesting note here, as you can see, I do not have a typical office chair. Uh, this is one of the things I've actually talked to a lot of people about when they're working from home. First thing I ask is, do you have a pet? And fortunately, most everybody does. Um, and I say, so where does your, when you're working, you know, where does your pet like to be? And if they've got a little pet bed, you know, by their desk or whatever, that's fantastic. Well, Gemma is a little bit more, uh, what I call my Velcro pup. She is always right next to me, right either. And right now she's like half on my lap and half on this chair with me. Um, and so when I, when I decided to change this desk up or change my desk up, I decided I needed a different type of chair because I had an office chair and that was prior to even having Gemma. Um, so once we got Gemma, 
she would always try to jump up with me, but she was so tiny, she'd actually slip down um, underneath the armrest of my office chair. So I'd, I'd have to keep like boosting her up and boosting her up. And then I realized, wait a minute, what if I get a different type of chair? So I started looking for uh, you know, larger chairs and looked at a bunch of different ideas and realized a settee, S-E-T-E-E, settee, um, it's like a tiny little couch. And so I found this one on Amazon and it's by the Christopher Knight collection, Christopher Knight of, um, um, who's the middle Brady? Who's the middle Brady? I can never remember his name from the Brady bunch, but the middle Brady, Christopher Knight, he's now a furniture designer, believe it or not. Um, and it's green velvet. I mean, come on. It's like so beautiful. But Gemma's up here all the time. She's up here right now. It's completely comfortable. It's ergonomic. No problems there. And this is actually my office chair. So why would I ever, ever want to go back and do a cubicle, right? Uh, let's see. And then I just, you know, I've got a lot of fun things. Here's a beautiful Moira Rose quote. I'm positively bedeviled with meetings, etc. Oh, I just, I always have Moira Rose's voice in my head. Um. But, you know, just making it those little touches. So as you're setting up your own remote working space, do this. You know, I've got plants all over. I've got, you know, funny signs. I've got my dog. I've got colors. I mean, this, going back to, if you look at the, the workspace that I've got, um, it was silver. And I bought a really cool color called Coastal Sage um, spray paint and took everything outside of my driveway and spray painted it. It's because I love the color. Um, you know, so just doing those little touches, it gets me excited. I love being in this space. It's so personal. Um, and I just feel so productive. And I, I just absolutely love it. So those are some of the things you can do. One of the last things I'm going to tell you, if, <laughs> and there's a big reason why I had to do this. So one of um, Towards the beginning of the pandemic, when everything was online, I was doing a presentation just like this. I was in exactly where I am now, talking to, I don't know, one of the libraries that, that is wonderful and generous enough to host me for these presentations. And um, all of a sudden, one of my neighbors came by and just started, and I don't have a doorbell, by the way, took the doorbell down 20 years ago go and I started working from home, you know, bang, 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 bang. And Gemma goes nuts and starts barking and everything. And it's, oh my God, one of my neighbors has stopped by and I'm doing a presentation just like this. So I actually had to say, everybody, I'm so sorry. Just give me one moment. And I had to put on, you know, stop my video, uh, mute myself and run over and say, I can't talk. It was my neighbor just coming over to say hello and, you know, mask on and everything. It's not social time. Go away. Um, so I actually ended up making one of these signs. This is not I, the sign I have. I'm, I'm in the process of redoing it. So this is not actually one of the ones that I have. But if you have uh, neighbors who stop by or deliveries where your delivery guy knocks on the door or anything like that, just make a little sign and hang it up you know, outside your house. I will say this. That hasn't necessarily stopped all my neighbors, but for the most part, it has. So, um, so those are just some some things. Now, when you are, here, let me get out of this. There we go. Uh, all right. So when you are creating your space, if you have family, you know, if you've got kids, bring them into the design part of it. You know, ask them, okay, so here's, you know, here's a plant I'm naming after you. Where should I put it? You know, things like that. Give them some creative control just so they understand really what this space is for, uh, you know, and then they'll understand, okay, when mom or dad is in this space, it's private time, you know, can't come in, can't play, can't make noise, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I have found with talking with my own clients that that usually works best uh, if the kids are kind of brought into those decisions. I don't have kids, so that wasn't actually, I have Gemma, and <laughs> she's pretty easygoing about that stuff. Um, but for my clients who have kids, they've actually said bringing the kids into the design decisions uh, kind of gives them control and they, they kind of understand what's going on. Um, but just make sure that, you know, whatever 
whatever you do choose that you've got the privacy, um, that you can be effective and productive, that you've got all the tools that you need. Um, now, Zoom interviews, completely different, you know, prior to Zoom working, <laughs> you very might, might well have a Zoom interview. When you do, in, and by the way, you might have a Zoom interview for a job that isn't remote, but just, you know, just be prepared. Um, one of the, a couple interview tips here, one of the questions, and this is especially true if the job is going to be remote. If the job is going to be remote, employers are now asking that their candidates pick up their, you know, phone or laptop or whatever it is they're working on and just kind of give like a 360 degree shot of the workspace where you're going to be working. This has been quite a controversial thing and employers really are doing this. So career coaches, you know, in, in our networking groups, we're talking about this. Like, can you believe our clients are being asked to do this? And a lot of the career coaches are saying, oh, this is horrible. It's an invasion of privacy. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm the descendant vote on that one. I don't think it's a bad idea at all um, because an employer, if they're going to entrust you to work remotely, they want to know what is this actually going to be like. So before a Zoom interview, have that, you know, have that area set up um, if, you know, as much as possible, but have that area set up just so an employer can get really comfortable that, yeah, this is going to be a good space. It's going to be private. It's going to be productive. Uh, it's, you know, clean. If you're doing Zoom calls with clients, the employers, you know, obviously they're thinking, so what are our clients going to see? So that's kind of a big thing. Um, I hire, uh, all of my employees are remote. And quite frankly, I've never asked them that and never will I, um, but I do understand the question. And I don't think it's that bad of a question. Um, watch your, you know, watch your where your camera is when you're done. Oh, oh boy, make sure to turn off your camera. That's just a security issue. If you leave your cam, uh, if you leave your camera on or like with mine, I've got um, a little slide, you know, that covers it. When you are all done anytime virtually, make sure to cover your camera if possible. That's a big security feature. It has nothing to do with the employer. Hackers can actually access your computer through your, if your uh, camera is on or if the security window thing is left on. So don't forget about that. Um, but here's something interesting. Um, Illinois, Illinois is really one of the, one of the states who are leading the way on this. In 2019, Illinois passed the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act. They love syllables. So I'm gonna say that again. Illinois passed the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act. Uh, now, this law re requires that employers disclose. Um, so if they are going to record the interview, you have to be notified by law of that. And then you also have to be notified what they do, how long they preserve the interview, that sort of thing. Here, I've got more information on here. Let me officially tell you what this is. This law requires employers to disclose when they are using AI in accepting video interviews. Uh, interview inter Employers must notify and provide applicants the following. AI may be used to determine the applicant's fitness for the position. Uh, the information before the interview, so they have to provide information before the interview on how the AI works and how it determines a candidate's fitness. Uh, they have to get consent from the candidate uh, to be evaluated by AI. Um, and furthermore, under this law, videos may not be shared and applicants have the option to have, have their data deleted. So there's a lot more information, you know, legalese on that, but that's kind of an interesting thing. So if you actually end up, uh, whether you get hired or not, you can actually go back to that employer once the interview process for, you know, onboarding, whatever is, is completely finished and you can request that they delete that video and they would have to comply with you. So Illinois leading the way for privacy, I'm all for it. Uh, so that's what I have right now. And I'm more than happy to open this up to any questions. Um, Matt, hopefully, you know, I don't know if you've got any questions or you've, if you see any in the chat, but I'm happy to take any if you've got them.
Um, first off, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, sure. Just, um, it was Peter Brady. I um, said it was Peter Brady as Chris. Peter, Knight. thank you. <laughs> I always forget that too. I always forget that too. Um, <laughs> but a question that I often get at the library is, um, in terms of remote work, is where is like a good place to find remote jobs? Like people have office jobs right now. Oh. They're looking to get get into that remote atmosphere. What is the best place or where is the best place in those? those yes, of jobs? I love it. I love it. That's a fantastic question. So right now, just about any of the job portals. Now, my my number one favorite job portal, if you've ever attended any presentation by me, you've heard me talk about LinkedIn before. I'm on LinkedIn every day. Um, if I were looking for a job today, LinkedIn is where I'd spend probably 98% of my online time. Um, the cool thing about LinkedIn jobs is that you can go in uh, let's say that you're working, looking for a project manager job, put in the, you know, put in project manager into that section, but then it asks about geography. If you put in remote, it's only going to pull up jobs that are listed as remote. It's also going to pull up jobs. Most likely I want to say that are partially remote. So hybrid, um, any, anywhere, if the location is listed as remote, uh, those jobs are going to pop up. And as you can imagine, the numbers, you know, the numbers of jobs from the beginning of the pandemic to now that list as remote, just booming, absolutely booming. Um, and really, I encourage people, even if they think that um, that their job couldn't be fully remote, still look and see if maybe there are um you know, hybrid opportunities or anything. But the cool thing is that most every, uh, you know, Indeed, Career Builder, Monster, even more niche ones uh, of the job portals, same thing. If you put remote into the geography panel, it's going to pull up remote jobs. Um, if you're looking for any kind of, let's say that you're looking for independent contractor type positions, so rather than employee, um, but maybe freelance um, or, you know, side hustle type work, Tons of those are around. There's um, freelancer.com. There's guru.com, um, remote.com, uh, moonlight, moonlighting.com, uh, creative circle. That's another one for mostly creative people. Upwork, um, tons and tons. Upwork is, is a really good site because they keep buying up a bunch of the smaller ones. So it kind of limits my list a little bit, but Upwork is just has a ton of them. Uh, hire my mom. Dot com is another one. I've actually hired a couple of people from there. So that's one of my favorite sites. But uh, lots of remote specific sites, as well as remote opportunities on traditional sites out there. So pretty much anywhere you're looking for a job, you can find remote jobs now. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, we did have another question come in through the chat. And this is more of um, how to kind of ask this question um, in an interview or um, of the employer is how can you determine if the position is going to be remote on a permanent basis or a temporary basis? You know, that is a matter of, you know, asking just really quite frankly, coming out and asking that question in an, in an interview, you know, what are your plans for this position as far as remote hybrid coming back into the office? Do you have anything mapped out uh, specifically for this position? So you can ask it during the interview. Now here's the thing. Do they need to tell you the you know the truth and stick with it? No, because again, going back to the first one of the first things I said, it's not illegal for a job to pull a remote opportunity and say you know within a month or you know hopefully they would give some good time uh, for the adjustment, but you know within a month, within a two months, whatever, everyone is coming back into the, the office. So. You should ask it, but then also if you know anyone from within the company or if you can network from within the company by meeting, you know, finding people on LinkedIn or some other place and just saying, you know, I'm interviewing or, you know, hoping to schedule an interview soon. I'm looking for a remote opportunity. Um, what's the temperature? You know, what what's the temperature of this company as far as remote work? And I think this is really important to kind of, if you can, Get the, you know, figure out what the attitude is from other people, not just the one you're interviewing with, because there are so many um, 
I'm part of I'm I'm part of a lot of different online networking groups and we talk about the the issues that our clients face in order for us to become better coaches. And right now, one of the biggest conversations that we're having with our clients is a manager's poor attitude towards remote, you know, mis mistrust by management. It's such a big thing right now. So what that means is you know, there could be remote opportunities that are pulled after they're offered, um, or it could mean management is just hopefully going to evolve and adjust and, you know, let it settle down. But from company to company, we just don't know. There's just no way to know which way it's going to go. So not only asking in an interview, but also trying to get, uh, like I said, try to take that temperature from, from the actual employees who are, uh, who are working in the company is a great way to do that too. But I also, you know, let me also just say, if a company is, is hiring, they're interviewing people for remote positions, they should expect that question. They, sh they shouldn't even make a candidate ask that. You know, they should already be prepared to say, here's what our remote uh, process looks like going forward. We're committed to remote and here's how we set it up and here, here are the resources that we provide. You know, they should, are, they should be providing this information by now without needing to be asked. So quite frankly, if you have to ask, I would see that as a little bit of a red flag. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, are there